Hello and welcome back, folks. This is a lecture on Chapter 13, which is Completing Business Proposals and <laughs> Business Reports. And I spent up more time than I'm willing to admit trying to find a clip from the office or parks and recreation or something humorous <laughs> around this topic. And I wasn't able to find much, but I did find something I think would be very illuminating and entertaining, at least. It's a clip from a show called Mad Men. And they're talking there. What I like about this clip is that there's uh, two proposals in there, one ineffective and one effective, and one is based on uh, one type of research and the other one seems more based on, well, I'll let you uh, decide. I just want you to watch the clip and then when you come back, uh, think about whether or why the first pitch was ineffective, the first proposal, uh, what was so effective about that second one, uh, why did Don succeed in the end? I think you'll uh, enjoy analyzing that and then I uh, will continue the lecture. Uh, so here are the learning objectives for this lesson. We'll talk about uh, how completed reports affect your credibility, hopefully in a good way, not a bad way. We'll talk about creating a specific as well as a persuasive proposal. And these are related, but they're not the same thing, obviously. Uh, we'll talk about a precision-oriented style uh, that you'll be striving for in these reports. And uh, we'll talk about how to design your reports to aid in the decision-making. What are some structural techniques uh, what's an executive summary, uh, etc., cetera, uh, headings and so on and so forth. Uh, we'll talk about how to project object objectivity in reports. You don't want to sound biased. You don't want to sound overly enthusiastic, uh, for example. And then we'll talk about reviewing reports for both effectiveness on the one hand, but also fairness. And here's the overview of the chapter. And as you can see, once again, pretty much fits those learning objectives. And so let's talk first about how completed reports affect your credibility. And this is something I'm you know, very experienced with. I've seen countless uh, presentations and parts of various committees I'm on where they'll bring in people from the, <laughs> the outside, business people basically, uh, to try to sell us on uh, you know, whatever solution they've concocted. Uh, for example, there's a, uh, one of the committees I'm on is called the Curriculum Committee. <laughs> uh, recently it was proposed that uh, we add another sort of subcommittee to this so we can be more like a Mankato. And, you know, there were some, the dean and some uh, some of uh, his associates came in and they provided us with the facts, you know, who else is taking this approach. Uh, some conclusions based on that, you know, they basically said it was seemed to be working well for these other schools that are, uh, you know, relatively similar uh, to St. Cloud State. Uh, they were gearing it all towards us you know, as the people that actually vote on these things, is will this, uh, you know, what will this mean for us if we go with this, uh, uh, you know, if we accept this proposal? Uh, yeah, caring about our needs, and that's one of the reasons they were there. Uh, they asked lots of questions and to get our uh, opinion on things and then <laughs> at least seemed to care. Uh, and then reporting uh, honestly and transparently. So they talked about some of the problems uh, they had run into and, you know, how they'd gone about collecting the data. And so that's just one recent example. You know, I've seen plenty more about, uh, uh, I mean, I've put together some of these too. I remember one was a white paper I was commissioned to do by the a textbook publisher. And this was uh, about wikis because I kind of had a reputation. I'd published an article, research article about wikis. They felt like I seemed to have some credibility in this area, <laughs> some competence. And so they paid me a couple of grand to uh, write a white paper, uh, just telling them what wikis are, Who's using them? How are they using them? Is, do I? What are my thoughts on business opportunities? Does this seem like something the publisher should invest in? If so, how? And so I put all this together, you know, and you know, it's just a real life example. There's you know, millions of other ones, uh, but yeah, part of, a lot of it has to do with can I establish myself as a credible expert? Can I make? Can I put information into this report and uh, organize it and present it in such a way that it'll be convincing? And hopefully they'll come back to be uh, next time they have a problem or <laughs> sense an opportunity and I can make some more money with this. And so in other words, this, this is definitely not uh, fictional hypothetical material here. This is real life uh, writing that you can, you know, if you get good at proposals and reports, you're pretty much set for life. <laughs> uh, but it's not easy, obviously. All right, let's talk first about the business proposal. And these are certainly the most common types. I've written and reviewed these things for decades now, uh, usually in the context of book proposals, uh, but I've seen plenty of other types 
of proposals. Uh, when we do an academic conference, people submit proposals. We look at that and see, basically, is, is this a worthwhile proposal? Uh, so they talk about the research they're doing. You know, and of course, you did one, a uh, simulated one in this class. So you have a pretty good idea of, of that. Uh, but just imagine all the different kinds of proposals that these businesses are looking at. Uh, I used to have students write, um, uh, look into franchises, restaurant franchises, and write a, you know, complete one of those proposals just so they could think about what goes into, say, uh, oh, there's, they always wrote, wrote about Sonic. <laughs> so I, I read all these business proposals from students about how they would like to see a Sonic uh, drive-in here in St. Cloud. And, they, you know, they did the work and they uh, tried to make a convincing case. Of course, you, you can probably think of one big reason <laughs> uh, why there might not be a Sonic drive-in here in St. Cloud, Minnesota. But, but anyway, I digress. Uh, okay, so most successful proposal writers speak to decision makers before submitting an official proposal. You know, obviously, uh, when I'm doing a book proposal, I always talk to the publishers, the editors first. Just call them up or email, say, you know, here's some ideas I'm having. Uh, what do you think about this? And usually they can kind of fine tune it a little bit. Or just tell, they might tell me up front, no, not a good idea. <laughs> uh, but if they like the idea, even if they love the idea, say, you know, Matt, that is a rock solid proposal, uh, a rock solid idea. They can't just say, yes, we'll do it. Uh, they still expect me to write a formal book proposal, uh, do all the, uh, you know, do all the research, marketing research, competition, you know, all this stuff. I have to basically make a case. There's some a good, this is a solid business proposal uh, because, of course, this uh, editor or publisher will have to go before, uh, in this case, his board, uh, the you know, basically the, uh, what, what you call them, the uh, uh, stakeholders in that company, and make a case that this is, in fact, a good proposal. So I'm sort of making his job easier by providing him with uh, convincing facts uh, about my book idea. But it's the same. That is the same thing you would go through for just about any kind of business proposal. Uh, so, yeah, some of the details ahead of time, uh, a better sense of what they want and expect. is nothing worse than going through this process and then finding out this is you know your proposal uh, it really isn't doesn't have anything to do with them or this is outside their field etc uh, okay components of a business proposal the cover page uh, pretty self-explanatory i would think uh, the executive summary we'll get into that the current situation specific objectives deliverables overview and the timeline i'm going to highlight these right now because these are what tend to get ignored and when really they're actually absolutely critical, at least from the point of view of the person funding this uh, research. And then our results enhancers and pricing and budget. So excellence in thinking for reports. So they said that one of the most important things is to demonstrate excellence in thinking. Uh, it sounds kind of vague, but uh, it makes a little more sense, I think, if we look at this uh, pyramid here. Uh, so you got the business problem. Uh, that you've thought a lot about. The book talks about these uh, green meetings and a lot of these companies and businesses, they, before they didn't really care about the environment, I suppose, <laughs> but now this is a big factor. You know, which uh, hotel do they want to have their conference in? Uh, one of the big problems is this company wants to uh, appear to be eco-friendly, small carbon footprint, uh, etc. And so you can really ruminate on this problem, show that you really understand this problem well, uh, or you could come across as you don't even know what a green meeting is. Uh, you don't know much about the <laughs> environment or <laughs> anything that you don't know anything about this. Uh, uh, these companies that are preferring green solutions. You know, I don't know if anybody would be in that <laughs> that poor of a problem. <laughs> uh, but you could see how that would just pretty much ruin everything else. I mean, if you don't have a good handle on the problem, uh, this pyramid falls apart. That's the base. Uh, then the facts about the problems are really specific things, statistics numbers uh you know what, what other hotel chains are offering green meetings etc how much does it cost to implement these plans and what are the diff different ways you could be eco-friendly uh, conclusions you can draw and then own up to the specific recommendations you want to make uh, maybe you could conclude that the costs are just too high it would really wouldn't benefit this particular hotel chain you know for example that might be your recommendation now, or your rec recommendation might be full steam ahead. 
So the precision oriented style, style we're talking about, a little bit different than some of the other styles we've been talking about. And obviously we need to be accurate and well documented with our facts. Uh, there's nothing that's going to, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're just being vague, like you see a lot of student papers where they say things like studies show blah, 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 but they don't actually cite those studies. Uh, maybe they even get certain parts of it wrong or they cherry pick their studies, only look at the ones that validate the position and they ignore the ones that go against it. <laughs> uh, anything like that will ruin your credibility uh, with any, you know, executive or uh, decision maker that's uh, <laughs> worth getting a paycheck uh, that they're <laughs> that are uh, earning their paycheck, right? They'll see through that. Uh, good reasons to come to your conclusions. Uh, so sometimes uh, you see a problem where you might have a lot of facts there, but you don't really connect those facts to your conclusions. Uh, so you got all these surveys that you've done, but then the your recommendation and your your conclusion and your recommendation don't really fit with those facts. The facts don't really support your argument. And again, I'm sure you've seen this in student papers before where they'll have uh, just sort of random quotations or stats. They don't really seem to pertain uh, to the situation. Uh, the foundation for the facts, conclusions, and recommendations must be a well-stated business problem or challenge. And this little bit here is something that I see a lot too in the culminating projects and for graduate students. And so when you're writing, before you write a thesis or a start papers project or portfolio, you have to have uh, a proposal. Of course, part of that is the, they call it a business problem here. You might call it a, a research area, research question. Uh, but there has to be some reason, right? Why this work is worth doing. Uh, what is the opportunity? Are you filling a gap uh, in the knowledge? Uh, is the information that you accumulate doing this research going to benefit people beyond yourself? <laughs> right, all that sort of thing. Uh, so even though this is business we're talking about here, most of this overlaps nicely, I think, with academic writing. Okay, demonstrating excellent thinking by applying pre uh, precision-oriented style part two. Uh, start with a clear statement of the business problem or challenge. And again, good advice too for thesis writers. You know, what is your what problem are you looking into? What is the, the key challenge here? Uh, using fact-based language as opposed to opinion hyperbole. Uh, you don't want this to sound like a commercial or an advertisement. Right? This is supposed to be a report. Uh, documenting secondary research, avoiding plagiarism. Uh, obviously important with academic writing, but you could imagine too, a, you know, a business could get sued, I'm sure, if somebody was just ripping off somebody else's uh, report, not giving them credit. Uh, basing recommendations on facts and conclusions in the report and providing specific and actionable uh, recommendations. So what they mean by actionable there is important. Uh, so it's something they can actually do. Like you're giving them a step or two, maybe two or three steps they can implement. Uh, it's not just a vague sort of suggestion, but, you know, but here's what we can do now uh, to implement these uh, recommendations. You know, here's how we can act on what uh, on the information I've compiled here in my report. Uh, again, businesses don't want to pay you for research that doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, they need to, this needs to amount to money somehow. Okay, let's look at some uh, less effective problem statements or business challenges. Uh, so remember, this is the less effective example. So they say, since 2011, our revenues from conventions and meetings have declined by roughly 23%. One reason that we may not have rebounded is that we still do not provide options for clients who want green meetings. Uh, so they say this brief statement does suggest one reason revenues may have dropped. Uh, so they put that there is that they don't provide options for the green meetings. However, it lacks context, contextual details that provide the urgency to solve this problem. Uh, so there's very little background there. <laughs> the more effective. <laughs> well, it's certainly longer. Uh, so I don't know if I'm going to read this this whole thing or not. And uh, let's see if we can get to the uh, key differences. Uh, here's some of the context here. Uh, since meetings constitute nearly 60% of our total revenues and form the basis for our reputation as a high class provider of events, we may need to seek new ways of building our conventions and meetings business. So there's a little bit of uh, what I would call exigence. Right, the 
reason why this is important, some of the context. Then they go into more context here about the Great Recession of uh, 2007. And if you look closely, you'll see they've even put in some uh, sources there. And then at the end, they say, instead of the, uh, one reason, they still have that, but they don't make it sound like the only possibility. Now, they just say one reason we may not have rebounded is we do not provide uh, the green meeting options. And then they've got a reference here from uh, this is Barbara Brookshire, who's noticed that many meeting players inquire about the green meeting options. So this is what you'd call anecdotal evidence, but it's, it's some kind of evidence, right, for this. So you can really see the difference here. Uh, there's a lot more context. There's a lot more uh, reasons in here why this is important. Yeah, provide, it does provide sufficient context to communicate the severity of the situation. Uh, they lost revenue, but also they talk about why that's a big deal. And then the anecdotal evidence, right? Uh, so this would be, again, even though we're talking about businesses, be really nice uh, for you and your own research uh, to get, you know, to keep this idea in mind, right? <laughs> Not just what is the problem, uh, but why do we, why should we care about the problem? Uh, what can we, why is this important? And what are some explanations? Is, is there anything we can do about it? You know, uh, if there's nothing you can do about a problem, why why bother researching it? <laughs> It'd be kind of pointless. <laughs> and I just give you uh, one more real life example. Uh, just just the, this morning, I opened up my email and there's a a mess uh, email there from the deans, uh, College of Liberal Arts, and they were saying they want to have this meeting. I think to, on Tuesday, and they want everybody to be there because they've got this. There's a problem. <laughs> Enrollments are down and the College of Liberal Arts more so than uh, some of the other areas on campus. So they, I guess they kind of want to have a brainstorming session uh, to talk about this. Uh, so this would be a prime opportunity for somebody to, you know, I'm sure in that presentation they will outline the uh, the problem that's going on, the challenge, what they want us to do about it. You know, how severe is, should we care about this? Is it, is it, uh, should we be uh, awake all night <laughs> stressing out about it? Uh, what can be done about it? You know, I'm sure that's what I'll have to look forward to on Tuesday. All right, fact-based language. This is a way to raise your credibility. Uh, supplying your facts with precision. So again, not saying things like many or some, uh, but to have numbers and statistics, uh, statistics to back you up and specific dollar amounts, uh, anything like that uh, is helpful there. Uh, supporting details for your conclusions. Again, linking the facts to what you're concluding based on those facts. Carefully dealing with predictions, cause effect statements. Uh, this is true for any kind of research. Uh, one of the bad habits you can get into is uh, citing that is a cause and effect situation where really there might not even be correlation. Uh, or your predictions uh, you might not have a good enough, sound enough evidence to be making predictions. <laughs> so, again, you have to think about the kind of data you have available and what you can reasonably conclude based on that. It probably won't be a cause and effect. Even like with smoking, uh, to go back to this uh, uh, clip from Mad Men, uh, there's, even, there's even some, even today, I don't know if you can say with certainty that cigarette smoking causes cancer. You know, I don't think that's quite how they word it. If you look closely, <laughs> they say something like uh, there's a high, it's associated with a high risk. You know, so there's a very strong correlation. You definitely should be uh, concerned about it, but they don't go so far as to say it causes it, at least as far as, uh, as I've seen. <laughs> I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, responsibly citing your research sources. Uh, so did you go to this, these big government databases uh, to get some statistics? Uh, did you use uh, research from another company without their permission? That <laughs> wouldn't be very good. <laughs> uh, did you plagiarize? Hopefully not. All right, here's some examples of these fact-based language we're talking about. <clears throat> Nearly all of our respondents reported satisfaction with their conference experiences. See, this is what I'm talking about. So instead of giving me a number or percentage, they just said nearly all. Well, what is nearly all? It's kind of subjective. It's kind of vague. Uh, better to say overall, the vast majority, 84%. All right, so there we have a specific number I can work with. 
Now, one, and then here's another one. One of the strongest indicators that meeting planners expect green meeting options is that they increasingly inquire about such meetings in RFPs. And so again, we have this, they increasingly inquire. Uh, well, yeah, they've put here, is this just the writer's opinion? We don't really know. Uh, they didn't put their site, uh, their information in. They didn't try to support this uh, with specific evidence. Uh, and the second example they do though, uh, so the same statement, but is followed by this. Uh, a recent survey showed that 71% of meeting planners already do or plan to inquire about green initiatives on RFPs, blah, blah, blah. And then they put the citation there, Shapiro uh, 2009, we could look that up, check into this study <laughs> and see. You know, by the way, something I want you to be thinking about as we're going through this is uh, deconstructing, deconstructing all this. Uh, so that if you're in a situation where somebody's proposing something that you don't like or you disagree with, uh, you can go back through these steps in reverse and try to see, you know, did they do these things? Uh, maybe you can poke some holes in their proposal. Uh, and even this Shapiro thing here, you know, maybe we could look up, look into this study and see whether it follows these guidelines, or maybe there's some uh, shoddy research uh, bias work there. You know, once you start, you, basically what we're talking about here is how to build up your credibility. Uh, but you could take these same steps, apply it uh, to, uh, you know, challenge somebody else's. Uh, let's see, documenting secondary resources. So you probably won't have a work cited list per se in a lot of these business uh, papers, uh, but they definitely will have a bibliography or reference list. Usually the businesses don't care so much about a particular uh, style guide, <laughs> APA or MLA or whatever. Uh, they just want to know where you got your information from. Uh, you can footnotes, endnotes, you know, companies will have their own style for, for this. Uh, but at the very least, you should have some reference list uh, that shows all the sources. And of course, the more you have, uh, the more credible you look. And that's part of it, but also, as we talked about last time, are these just <laughs> random websites or are these uh, official, uh, you know, credible sources uh, from legitimate organizations and think tanks and what have you? Uh, so providing citations throughout the document to indicate the information you have drawn. So you don't just put studies show, uh, but you have the names of those studies, uh, the actual percentage, percentages, numbers, stats from the survey. If it's coming from another company, what was the company? Uh, let's see, plagiarism. I'm pretty sure you know about plagiarism, <laughs> hopefully especially for teaching writing, but uh, I think these, uh, I'm not sure quite how I feel about some of these definitions here. They talk here about plagiarism being to steal and pass off the ideas of another uh, as one's own. Uh, so I, I guess I see what they're talking about here. Uh, even copyright law, though, doesn't go this far. Uh, with copyrights, you're talking about specific wording or the expression. They call that the expression of ideas. Uh, so if you came up with a uh, you know, you could write the most cliched, stereotype, formula, drivel <laughs> you want, and it really wouldn't be plagiarism uh, unless you were copying word for word uh, from some other source. or copying a little bit from this person, a little bit from that person, you know, that would still be plagiarism. Uh, in businesses, they f have all kinds of lawsuits around this idea of intellectual property, uh, the patents, uh, trade secrets. I mean, it gets to be a really complicated uh, subject. Uh, but I think the, the key to this really is, uh, again, the, the wording, making sure you're not copying wording or the structure of a document. Uh, you know, basically, if I look at exhibit A and exhibit B, and I can tell, <laughs> you know, readily <laughs> uh, that B was uh, derived from A, uh, that's what we probably consider that plagiarism. And one of the, I had a student in my office the other day and we were talking about the uh, uh, the Ghostbusters theme song. I'm sure you're familiar, you know, who you gonna call and all this. And uh, there was an accusation that that song plagiarized from uh, Huey Lewis in the news. Uh, their song uh, was that I want a new drug. <laughs> so they originally, they, you know, I was reading about this uh, and they were saying originally they didn't think there was anything to this. You know, a lot of music sounds the same. Uh, there's only so many beats and instruments and so on and so forth. So that could just be a coincidence. 
Uh, but what doomed uh, what doomed the Ghostbusters guy, I think Ray Parker Jr., was that they, I guess, uncovered this uh, conversation he had had uh, with the producers of the film where they told him, they played the song for him on one new drug and said, we want something like this. <laughs> you know, something in this style. Uh, so that's what, that was the key, the key link there to the plagiarism. If they hadn't had any kind of conversation like that, I guess you could have just said, well, you know, it's just, I like, <laughs> it's a good sound. <laughs> you know, a lot of songs sound alike, big deal. And of course, it's always possible too, that two people can come up with the same idea independent of each other uh, without having uh, copied. But anyway, I don't want to go on. It's just kind of one of my, uh, me and Carol Moorbacher, <laughs> you know her. Uh, we love talking about this stuff. Okay, direct quotations. Right, we're talking here about how to avoid plagiarism. Uh, this is a verbatim restatement from another source. Well, that is pretty technical definition. Uh, this is what we, you put the quotation mark, you put exactly what the line is, and then you close it, of course, with another quotation mark and you got your uh, source there. Uh, that's the direct quotation. And then you have paraphrasing, uh, which is you take the, the same meaning, but you put it in your own words. So this is the one you'll be using most of the time. Uh, you only use direct quotations when there's something significant about the way something is worded, uh, especially in a legal case, uh, like that Ghostbusters situation I was telling you about. Uh, I'm sure those lawyers had pretty, I, I don't know if they had a recording or what, but obviously it was very significant the way that was worded, that request to make it sound like Huey Lewis in the news, <laughs> uh, that song. So they probably quoted that part directly uh, but if they were talking about the sales, royalties, things of that sort, where the wording is less important than the ideas, and just paraphrase it. And of course you paraphrase it because every time you have a direct quotation that interrupts your flow, messes up your style. Uh, too much uh, quoting just makes it hard to read and breaks up any kind of coherence that you might have going there. You know, again, coming back to this idea of music again, it'd be like, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, types, some, what were we talking about, electronic music, and we were saying that, or me and this uh, student and I were having this conversation. We talked about how a lot of the songs will have samples uh, from other songs in there. Uh, but obviously there could be a point where you have so many samples that there's really, it's not much of a song anymore, right? It's just kind of a mess. It's just the whole thing is just sample, sample, sample. Uh, where's, the, where's the original content? You know, so you can go overboard. Uh, and there's just some examples here of APA and MLA. And MLA, unfortunately, it's really only used in English. And really, even within English, it's usually only literature classes. You know, as soon as you get out of a literature class, uh, you're using APA instead uh, most of the time. So I don't even, you know, even though MLA is what I'm most used to, <laughs> I tend to find, even in the journals I publish in, they don't use it. Uh, they're using APA instead. And this is, APA stands for American Psychological Association. A lot of the sciences use it. Now, there's a couple other ones. Chicago gets used a lot. And there's one, what's the other one called? A Turabian. Uh, but you know, if you're working for a big enough business, they'll have their own. Uh, MLA's Modern Language Association. But really, they're basically the same thing. And if you use, I always use the uh, software, just let it do this for me. If you use Microsoft Word, even there's a built-in documentation, you can look for that. Just go to YouTube and look for something like uh, Microsoft Word citations, something like this, because it's built in now and you can just, it'll do all this for you. And then at the end you could say, I want it APA or you could switch to MLA, just click, click, you know, boom, it does it all for you. It's not 100% accurate all the time, but who cares? <laughs> you know, really, uh, the key thing is that you you know, when I grade these, what I look for is, you know, is did you put the information I would need there so I could find this thing, look it up, see for myself? So did you put the page number where you got it, the quote from? Uh, did you put the, the name of the report, the year, uh, if it's a journal, etc.? Yeah, let's just look here at the scientific journal. Uh, so if you notice here, they've got, this is the APA one, they just put the initials there. Uh, Gal, comma, Y, L, initials. And they put the ampersand hand. <laughs> so this is the sort of business here. If you got a really strict teacher, uh, they'll dock you for this. You know, if you put uh, Yixing instead of YL, you might get docked. You know, I don't see the point in that level of uh, 
uh, <laughs> specificity, I guess. <laughs> uh, who cares? Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of the journals I publish in, they'll, they'll say things like, use APA except for this. <laughs> and they want to see the names instead of the initials. It gets crazy. All right. Uh, so a lot of this is just up to the journal. And if you look here, the capitalization is a little bit different. Actually, I think this author is wrong. Yeah, this slide is wrong, at least to my knowledge, because I'm pretty sure all of these words in MLA would be capitalized. Some of you that work in the right place could probably correct me or correct him. <laughs> and again, I don't care so much. Uh, the I do care about this, the fact that they put the journal name in italics, because I need to be able to distinguish that from the name of the article. And then all this information here is critical too. I need the, the volume and the, the date and the year. Uh, that's uh, key. And something else that's interesting too about this is you notice how in the APA they put the year up front. Over in the MLA, <coughs> over in the MLA example, you have to go all the way down the bottom to see the year. And I always thought this was because of the APA again is more associated with science and you know, empirical work. So in those cases, it's critical that you're using the most up-to-date research. Uh, whereas in MLA, you know, if you're writing this article about Shakespeare, Hamlet, <laughs> whatever it is, James Joyce, <laughs> uh, they probably you could use a source from 1970 or 60, or I guess even back to the 1700s or <laughs> earlier. <laughs> uh, you could go, you know, you could be uh, talking about uh, Aristotle and Plato, and it would be fine. Uh, so they care less about the the currency, I guess, uh, than they do about the uh, often the authority of the source in question. All right, I've gone on about that long enough, I think. There's quite a few of these personal interviews. All right, basing recommendations on facts and conclusions. So I think this is really important here. You know, I've said several times now that one of the biggest problems I see is that the you know, maybe the student has uh, great facts, uh, but the, when it comes to linking those facts to the conclusions and the recommendations, it's not so much. Uh, so let's just take a close look here at this slide, uh, dilate on it a little bit. Uh, so here's, they've got three facts, two conclusions, and one recommendation. That seems like a pretty good, <laughs> pretty good <laughs> structure to have. Uh, so plenty of facts to back up everything. Uh, so here's their fact. Uh, traveling to and from meetings is the largest cause of pollution and the largest contributor to a carbon footprint. So this is something I'm sure you have thought about. Uh, you know, sometimes there's a conference in the Twin Cities, and even that, <laughs> I'm thinking, man, <laughs> you know, how much gas is that going to take to get down there? Why can't they just? Why can't we just do this over Skype? Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, rising fuel price. Here's the second fact. Rising fuel prices have dramatically increased the cost of traveling long distances to meetings. Now you see they call these facts because this could be confirmed, right? Are fuel prices going up? Yes or no. You know, we could do that work. We could find this out. Uh, is traveling to and from meetings the largest cause of pollution and largest contributor to a carbon footprint? Uh, yes or no. You know, maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe it is. We could find this out. It's a fact or it's presented as a fact. Um, here's another one. Many public sector organizations are required to travel locally for meetings based on these, whatever the heck, uh, EPP guidelines are. So uh, those are the three facts in play. And then they're using these to make a conclusion. Uh, so the first conclusion is meeting planners in the private sector, wait, meeting planners in the private sector want to lower overall meeting costs and highlight lower carbon footprints as part of CSR efforts. Uh, so they can, can conclude that based on those two facts. Uh, or the second one is many meeting planners and public sector organizations are required to seek out local options uh, for meetings. Uh, so they confirmed the facts and that brought them to these uh, conclusions. So they said, yes, fuel prices are going up. Uh, yes, many public sector organizations are required to travel locally. And so what can we conclude based on that evidence or based on that uh, data? is that many meeting planners are required to seek out local options. Uh, so from those two conclusions, we can make our recommendation that we need to adjust marketing strategy to focus more extensively on local organizations. 
makes sense. You know, I could see how they get from these facts to those conclusions to that uh, recommendation. Uh, but if you're still confused, go back and look at it a few times. You know, make sure you're you're pretty comfortable with this idea. Uh, so let's make recommend making recommendations specific and actionable. Uh, there's four slides on this. So here's the less effective one. Uh, gain certification as a green meetings provider. And that's the recommendation. It is a somewhat specific, they say, but it's not actionable. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't really tell you what steps to take. Just gain certification as a green meetings provider. First thing everybody's thinking is, <laughs> how? <laughs> how do we do that? What's the step? Uh, look at this one instead. Uh, so they got the same sentence there, but they added a bunch of stuff a bunch of stuff on to it. Uh, gaining certification will immediately place us in a select group of venues. The process of gaining certification will help us develop further knowledge about providing green meetings. Moreover, uh, blah, blah, blah. So a lot more rationale about why that's a good recommendation. Uh, but then they get into the uh, uh, steps. So A, achieve level one compliance for each of the nine standards. B, gain green seal certification. C, gain recognition as green hotel. Uh, D, join the Green Meeting Industry Council. So they basically have uh, four steps, boom, boom, boom. So it's uh, good rationale, good specific steps. The decision makers can take a look at this, see what's involved. Looks like there's a pretty good bit of stuff involved too, right? Uh, so they can see all that, understand it, and then make a reasonable decision on it. You know, this, this kind of thing comes up with these uh, committees about software all the time. Like one of the ones that came up recently was uh, this proposal that uh, all the emails, all the email addresses, all the logins amongst the different Minnesota State Universities, Mankato, uh, Bemidji, etc. Uh, they want to consolidate everything so that, you know, they have these students that are taking classes in multiple universities and they want to make it easier for uh, that to happen, not to have to keep logging in to two or three uh, different accounts every time. You know, if you take a class in Mankato, they don't want to have a whole separate login uh, than when you're taking a class at St. Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Etc. And so, you know, it all sounded good, uh, but this was the part that really mattered, right? Was what are the steps? What will we actually have to do to make that happen? Uh, that was kind of a big question mark. So we had meetings that laid all this out for us. Now, let's see, here's another example. Uh, focus on energy efficient transportation for our guests. So we get vague. <laughs> what is energy efficient transportation? Uh, how how can how will we make this happen? Uh, more effective, get a fleet of hybrid or alternative fuel vans, and then they go into more detail about why that's a good idea, or why this is the right step. They put the a number in here. Let's see, our initial estimates suggest that we could replace our four van fleet for roughly a hundred thousand dollars after trade in or sell. Uh, so I remember in the one that I was telling you about with the. Uh, uh, the, the sort of star ID, a universal star ID login thing. Uh, it wasn't about money. I guess it didn't really cost anything. Uh, the problem was the training. You know, they they had to have, uh, and it was going to take some time. But that was the big biggest deal was that they would need, you wouldn't be able to log in, I think, for two weeks, something like that. That would basically be the cost, is that the system would be down for two weeks, and then there'd be a certain period of uh, copying over information. I mean, I'm kind of blanking on the details, but uh, that was uh, part of the recommendation and the, uh, what made it specific and actionable, uh, that kind of precision. Uh, designing your reports to help decision makers. Yes, yeah, assume that decision makers may not read your report from start to end, and they probably won't, right? And so they need to be able to navigate the information rapidly. And this is uh, painfully clear in this curriculum committee I've been telling you about off and on uh, this semester. Uh, so there'd be a professor that wants to make a new course or they want to, uh, maybe there's a, a chair, a whole department, maybe they want to change up their program, uh, add some prereqs, take away prereqs, add a credit onto a course, change a course description, you know, it goes on and on. Uh, but when this committee shows up, nobody there, probably not even the chairs of the committee has even looked at that uh, proposal. <laughs> <laughs> don't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, just first time seeing it in a lot of cases. Uh, so that that's the reason why they have this curriculum navigator software. It's to provide some kind of consistency with these uh, proposals uh, so that even though it's something we haven't looked at before, uh, we don't have to 
turn all around, scan through it, trying to get to like, what, well, what are the program requirements? Uh, what are the learning outcomes? And what's the name of the course? Uh, how many credits? You know, all that's in a familiar place. You know, every proposal will be in the same spot. And so that makes it easier to navigate that information rapidly. Uh, so even though if we haven't looked at it before, we didn't really have to. You know, you can get to the parts that matter quickly. And so, so that's, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say anything about Curriculum Navigator is good, but uh, the, <laughs> that uh, purpose was good, or that goal was a good one. Uh, let's see, one way to make the report easy to navigate is to provide a structure that decision makers are familiar with. You know, if you're working for a company and they tell you to write something, write a white paper, write a report. Uh, here at St. Cloud State, we have these things called professional development reports. So the first thing, when I got here and they said that you're going to need to write a professional development report, it's due on such and such a date. Uh, first question I ask is, uh, do you have a sample a professional development report, a good one, uh, that I can take a look at. Uh, you know, it's not that my information would be the same, obviously not, but I could get a sense of the structure of it, the headings, the length, etc., sections it might have, and uh, that way I could turn in one that they were familiar with, rather than just do my own thing and have them uh, have to waste a lot of time uh, getting to the relevant info. Let's see, common structures for business reports. So we got survey reports. Again, we said that's the most common in business, so a good chance you'll be writing those. Uh, executive summary, intro, background, methodology, findings, conclusions, recommendations, reference and appendices. So very similar to any kind of research report, science, scientific report. You know, there's even that methodology. You know, how did you do the survey? Uh, what kind of participants did you get? What was your sample size? How did you compile the uh, or calculate the uh, statistics if you have those in there? Uh, trend reports. Let's see. Is, there, is that one any? Well, you have a trend analysis, obviously, uh, instead of the methodology. And I guess they don't have findings. Uh, components of a business proposal: cover page, executive summary, current situation, specific objectives, deliverables, overview, uh, results, enhancers, <laughs> and pricing. All right, and here we have the uh, a couple other ones, uh, business plan. And some of you might be interested in starting your own business. I think a few of you have you know, expressed some interest in, in that. And there's a lot to business plans. I mean, there's whole courses dedicated to it. And there's professors over in the business school that obviously know a lot more than I do about it. And so I would uh, definitely consult with them if that's something you're interested in. Uh, but nevertheless, you could get a, you know, even here you could see it's really not all that different in terms of uh, organization uh, than these other kinds of reports. So, uh, you know, what you learn here will be valuable for that. A strategic plan, you know, this one has a, a SWOT analysis as part of that. Uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then the composition, or let's see, components of a progress report. Again, executive summaries, intro, background, accomplishments. Future plan. So this is pretty close to the, what I was talking about with that PDR, Professional Development Report. Oh, and yet, yet more. <laughs> Annual reports, uh, just a straight up SWOT analysis, and then the uh, components of a marketing plan. Uh, so the book proposals I do usually have a marketing plan in miniature, uh, where we talk about these things and <clears throat> trying to figure out, for example, uh, you know, is there a market for this book? You know, Barton, you want to write this history of computer role-playing games? Who's going to, is there anybody out there that would buy this book? Can you prove that? You know, that's part of the market research. And I can look at things like, are there other books like it on Amazon? What are the sales rank if there are? Uh, or maybe uh, figure out how many people are playing these games, showing interest in them. You can get that information from various sources. Uh, and on down the list. All right, components of a formal report. And so we got the letter or memo of transmittal. So you don't want this thing just coming over the transom, so to speak. And they're like, whoop, <laughs> well, why is this huge report printing or why is this big attachment coming? Uh, they have something in front of it uh, called the memo of transmittal. This kind of goes back to the days of the fax machine uh, because people would have to decide if they wanted to pay uh, to have all this stuff printed out 
on their end. Uh, they could just reject it based on this uh, letter of transmittal, sort of the first thing that would come over. They print that out and then decide whether to print it or not. Uh, but nevertheless, it's useful. Uh, the cover page, title page, copyrights, tables of content, a table of contents, list of tables, figures, preface or forward, acknowledgments. Uh, that's what they call the front matter. Uh, the text, executive summary, intro, findings, recommendations, conclusions, kind of what we've been talking about. And then the uh, back matter would be a reference list, bibliography, works cited, whatever you want to call it. Appendices, uh, maybe you want to have copies of the survey that you gave there, for example. Uh, and then any kind of extra attachments. Okay, so let's break all this down. Uh, the executive summary, uh, that is the purpose of that, to summarize the most important contents, including key findings, conclusions, recommendations, uh, so that busy executives and other decision makers can quickly understand and act on the report. And I find this is what students really struggle with the most. Uh, they're okay with sort of telling you about the type of work they want to do, uh, but they don't want to put in the conclusions and the recommendations. They feel like that's kind of giving it away, <laughs> right? So it's like it's spoiling the movie, uh, when really that is exactly what you want to do in the executive summary. Uh, you're kind of assuming if they don't read anything but this little paragraph or two or three paragraphs, uh, will they get everything they need to know from that? Uh, obviously, it's not going to be comprehensive, uh, but you know, have you spoiled the movie <laughs> enough? <laughs> or have you left, you know, you haven't held anything back. Uh, you're um, basically forcing them to have to read the report to find out uh, something important. Uh, and then we have headings, and they just give you some of the ideas there. Title, recommend a 14 point bold for that, level one headings, level two. Uh, my advice with this is whether you're working with PowerPoint or Word, uh, don't don't mess with font sizes uh, or different fonts. Don't don't mess with that. Uh, if you click on uh, the heading with Word, highlight it. Uh, go up there, be a little section called Style somewhere, a little drop down menu, and it'll have in there level one heading, level two heading, and just uh, select that. Uh, do it that way. Reason for that is uh, later on, if you decide you don't like the look of that, you can change, with just one click, you could change all of your level one headings, all of your level two headings, uh, and so on and so forth, instead of having to go through individually and select every <laughs> last <laughs> heading. And, uh, you know, if you know enough about Word, you can, there's some useful tricks for this. Uh, one of the situations I found myself in one time was uh, as a temp, temp worker, temp agent, kind of like Ryan in the office, uh, they had hired me on there uh, for a couple of weeks worth of work, and it was just a big medical firm. And they wanted me to go through, I think, thousands of these uh, Word documents and change up. They basically changed the branding, the company. So they wanted me to change like the uh, the letterhead, the title, the some kind of uh, brand up there. I wanted that changed. But then they uh, wanted all these uh, level one headings, level two headings, and so on changed. Uh, to match their new uh, style guide. And they, when they showed me what I was going to be doing, they sat down and they like highlighted each one, <laughs> changed the font size uh, on down, changed the next one. It took them about, you know, good. Uh, I'm going to say at least about 10 minutes to go through one of these documents. So keep in mind, there's just thousands of these things. Uh, of course, and they just didn't, they didn't realize that with Word, you could just make it automatically find all of these headings and change them all with just one click. And, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or anything, but I knew enough to know that anything you do with a computer, if you have to do the same thing over and over again, uh, there's a better way to do it than manually. Uh, so I figured out how to use their um, the, the macros or macros of Word. Just tell it, you know, you go in, change one document, get it the way you want it and say, or you say, record what I'm doing. And you go in there, you change the headings. Uh, then you say, stop recording. And that creates a little program for you. You don't have to know any programming. And then you can just say, run that program <laughs> on this entire directory of like thousands of files. And boom, I mean, these folks were flabbergasted. Uh, they thought I was some kind of a uh, computer genius uh, when really that's just, you know, again, something anybody can do. It's simple. Uh, okay, title is descriptive. Uh, should the Prestigio Hotel develop and uh, market green meetings? I think we would all agree that's uh, very descriptive. 
Uh, the story of the report, executive summary, and then the business problem or challenge introduction to the green meetings. All right, let's see. Opportunities and risks. Uh, market demand for green meetings. Uh, many public sector organizations are required to hold green meetings. All right, I don't feel like I need to go through all of these. <laughs> Hopefully you get the idea, you know what opportunity is, you know what a risk is. Um, although you can imagine how it makes you more credible if you're clear about the risks. You know, if you made out like, oh, there's no risk to this, you know, it's, it's just all upside. <laughs> I'd probably think maybe you're a little bit biased. You're not really... Uh, thinking about the risks. Uh, like, for example, this whole migration to this new uh, email system. One of the risks they talked about was, you know, we could lose certain things. Uh, maybe some of the files wouldn't transfer right. Uh, maybe maybe you think it would be okay, but then when, you, when, when it's all said and done, suddenly you can't access your email archive. I mean, there are risks. Uh, let's see, best practices. Best practices and standards for green meetings. What does that mean? Well, getting certified standards. And let's see, potential rewards, uh, return on investment for green meetings. In other words, uh, we can make maybe uh, make up that revenue. And then the advice or recommendations. Okay, creating headings to help decision makers navigate the document. Uh, this is less effective. A report of the current market situation for green meetings with related recommendations. So is that a good heading? A report of the current market situation for green meetings with related recommendations. And I say it's difficult to process that uh, with a variety of noun clusters. Market situation, green meetings. Uh, more effective to say, ask it as a question. Uh, should the Prestigio Hotel develop and market green meetings? Question mark. It's a little more intriguing, uh, they say. Uh, signals the decision maker the central direction of the report. Uh, less effective to say best practices. Best practices of what? Uh, more effective to say standards and best practices for green meetings. And here we have preview statements. Uh, less effective. In our research, we found several trends that we discuss in the upcoming pages. It doesn't get much more vague than that. Uh, more effective. In our research, we found the following trends regarding green, uh, green meetings, colon, and then they got four of these uh, spelled out for you. So very specific, gives you a very clear picture of that document. And let's see, using charts to support the storyline of the report. <laughs> so, uh, this, is, this, is, this looks like fun. Uh, so less effective, they got a pie, pie chart there says gender, figure one, gender composition of survey respondents, women 46%, men 54%. They say this chart presents a set of statistics that is peripheral to the main themes of the report. Uh, report. Therefore, it is not a strategic use of space. You know, this is true. Look at the, it takes up a big chunk. Uh, over here we say, uh, guest satisfaction by gender, because that's really what they care about, right? They're, they want to know about the guest satisfaction. They're not so much about whether more men than women are there. Uh, let's see, would recommend 47% of women would, 66% of men would, and on, on down to overall satisfaction. So this chart is central to the storyline of the report as one key theme. So it's one of the key themes now, how women and men perceive convention experiences differently. So that's the kind of information right there that's just marketing gold, right? If you know a little bit about the demographics and how, if you know that men, uh, men prefer one thing, women prefer something else, if you have that knowledge, it's not going to be true in every case, obviously, but that's still a very valuable thing to know. So you're applying bulletin, bulletin. Uh, within the past few years, surveys show that the majority of meeting planners strongly consider green meeting options, for example, blah, blah, blah. This passage is too dense to read and process quickly. And if you look at it, you say, why? Well, it's because we've got years, 2009 survey, 51% of meeting planners, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 2010 survey, 93%, 51%, uh, 2011, 2010, ah, <laughs> your brain hurts. You can't picture all that. Uh, it's a little better to apply some bullets. Uh, more effective, so the same stuff as before, but they've put it into nice bullets for us. 
60% of meeting planners reported the green policies were very important or somewhat important. Okay, 64% said they were fairly important or critically important in their venue choices. That's uh, so a little easier. And of course, you'd probably want to supplement that with a chart or a table. <clears throat> All right, creating a cover page, table of contents, <laughs> and appendices. And so they say if it's more than 10 pages, you want a cover page on it. A lot of these will be much more than 10 pages. I mean, you might have hundreds of pages in there. Uh, at a minimum, the cover page should include title, names of those who wrote and are submitting the report, and the date. And again, the best thing to do is when, you, when you're tasked with this, uh, see if you can see a sample. Uh, ask them if there's common, if there's a style guide for your company that you can use. Uh, do they have a, most companies of any size will have a standard cover page. Uh, sometimes it's a Word document template. You just go in and fill in your, obviously, you know, the, <laughs> your name instead of the, uh, the blank and so on. Uh, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel with this stuff. Uh, let's see, a table of contents is expected for nearly any report over 10 pages. It's kind of silly to have that just for a couple page document. Now, reports also frequently include the appendices, provide references. Let's see, do they tell you what those are? Yeah, they could include a financial statement, marketing material, detailed data table, brochure. Now, basically, just information that's probably not critical to put in the document, but somebody might want to refer to it and so you can stick it in the appendices. And usually what I see there is, uh, you know, they might have a sample questionnaire uh, that they handed out to people so you could look at the exact wording of the questions and everything. Oh, they didn't want to take up space in their report doing it. See, achieving, achieving objectivity and positivity through tone. And so we want a can-do tone, uh, but not to be Let's see. More so than positivity, you should project objectivity. Yeah, this is what I'm. This is what I was talking about earlier. So you don't want to sound too enthusiastic. Uh, the sense that you're providing information, analysis, and advice that is sound, reliable, and unbiased. Uh, so you don't want to sound like that uh, my pillow guy. <laughs> you're presenting uh, your report. Uh, you're just kind of sticking to the facts and sticking to practical things that can be done. You know, the can-do tone. Uh, you're not being overly positive or negative. Uh, ensure your enthusiasm and strong positive emotion do not cloud your judgment. Uh, assessing key features of a completed report, value to the decision makers. Yeah, this is what it all comes down to, right? So you're not writing this for your own edification, your own interest, uh, but for whatever group you've uh, you know selected as the audience, or more likely uh, the group that's <laughs> has hired you to do the report. Uh, the precision of it. Uh, have you documented your sources properly? Do you have you <laughs> do you have sources? <laughs> and what about navigation? You know, do you have good headings? If it's long document, did you put a table of contents? Does it have an index? And maybe you even need a glossary. Uh, does it sound objective? Does it sound like ad copy? Reviewing your reports for fairness and effectiveness. So they say discuss the report with the ultimate decision makers. Uh, so they can best tailor the final product to their needs. So this would probably take place when you were at the proposal stage, right? And they'd, if they saw any problems with the proposal, they would tell you, you know, I can't, <clears throat> this won't be sufficient. You need more sources. <laughs> uh, or, uh, you know, we really, we, or we have a budget, you know, so we need solutions that are going to cost less than $1,000. You know, whatever it is, uh, you won't know that going in unless you talk to the decision makers. So that's why that's so critical. And let's see, review the report by yourself and with others, run through it numerous times, each time considering a different perspective. So that's exactly what these folks do when they come to these meetings. You know, these aren't professors. Uh, these would be uh, software experts, maybe somebody from the sales department, marketing department, could be one of the developers, uh, could be one of the managers. <laughs> you know, but they come in and then they have this report and they have to think about, well, what's a professor going to think when, when she looks at this? Uh, what's it going to look like to their IT people? Uh, what's it going to look like to the deans and the, you know, possibly even the president of the university? All right. Whew. <laughs> uh, chapter takeaways. I'm sure you're happy to see this slide. Okay, so here's what we talked about. How the reports affect credibility. So many ways you can go wrong. Uh, but, you know, you shouldn't be thinking about it that way. A uh, better way to think is, you know, here's a real opportunity to shine. You know, show my managers, bosses, professors that you know, I can be, I should be taken seriously. I can do this work. 
I'm competent, I'm caring, I have a good character, you know, all the stuff that goes into establishing that credibility. So these are great for that. Uh, specific and persuasive proposals, you know, not being, uh, I will say that thought, <laughs> precision oriented reports, reports that aid in the decision being made. Uh, again, that's why it's important to talk about, talk it over with the decision makers first. Uh, being objective in your report, not trying to sell something with these. Uh, you know, it's going to be persuasive insofar as you want to be, you want to persuade them that you should be taken seriously, you're credible, you've done your homework, uh, but it shouldn't be over the top, too enthusiastic or too negative. Uh, you don't want to sound like you're letting emotions uh, drive this thing, right? And so even with the, we've been talking in this chapter about the green meetings and being environmentally friendly, but you know, that doesn't come across as a, uh, you know, fanatical or zealous, or like somebody's, uh, you know, obsessed <laughs> with being green. <laughs> you know, that's not the tone that was struck here. Uh, instead of just in kind of down to earth, practical solutions here, there's, there's a reason for it, uh, basically make more money. Uh, and then if being effective and fair in the reports, it's not just about clarity, not just about the facts, right? <laughs> but have you been transparent? Have you been honest? Have you avoided plagiarism? and so on and so forth. All right, uh, I think this will do it. If you have any questions, comments, stories, maybe you've had to write a proposal, you probably will for your thesis if you're a graduate student, if you haven't done so already. If you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer those or about any business, anything to do with business proposals, reports, whatever it is, love to uh, you know talk to you about those. If you have your own stories to share, maybe you've had to do a marketing plan or business plan before, you know, I'd like to hear that story. Uh, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed this and see you next time.